countries that allow commercial surrogacy. This was not something that we were proud of, but this is how uh, it, it, it turned out. It was the cost differential that really grew this industry into a multi-million dollar industry. Uh, while people in Europe and the United States would have to pay something around $80,000 or $100,000 for the whole process uh, of uh, surrogacy. In India, this would cost around $20,000. So that was the difference. And that led to this boom in medical tourism uh, and reproductive tourism, as they would call it. And so a World Bank study in 2012 said that the, the industry in India was valued at around 400 million a year across 3,000 clinics. And the BBC News reports valued it at 2.3 billion annually with 5,000 surrogates born every year. It's not really clear about the numbers because just since there were very few regulations, there wasn't really a clear idea on how many clinics there were and how many uh, arrangements, uh, commercial arrangements were going on. So approximately what we know is about 12,000 foreigners sought surrogacy services every year. And most of them were from the USA, UK, Australia, and Europe. And so these were the kind of unflattering media headlines that appeared. Surrogacy capital of the world, rent a womb, baby outsourcing, and this was not what the Indian people would like to see. So there was a pushback and there was a lot of uproar and, and a protest in India around this time. This is not the image of India Incorporated and it was neither the image of spiritual India and people began to speak up. So let us go through some very quickly some of the social, legal and ethical concerns. This photograph here is one of a poster doctor of surrogacy in India, many would have heard of her. But what I want you to look at is the, the surrogates around her with their masks and shrouded persona. So the, the mask, the, you know, they were not willing to be photographed. They did not want to be known. Somehow they were not very happy with what they were doing. But the medical side of it was very, you know, enthusiastic about using this technology and how it could be used for others. So there was a kind of exploitation. So what we saw uh, happening in India was an exploitation just from looking at the profile of these women. Where are these women from? They were from urban slums. They were from semi-urban towns. People who had no other means to earn. Women who had very few, a very difficult uh, livelihood. So they would earn far less than what they could earn through this. And so there was this issue of the link with poverty and surrogacy. Poverty and lack of choices, which was an ethical concern. And the gender issue as well. Once again, women. Women in India who are discriminated right from the time that they are in their mother's womb with female feticide sex determination um, and onwards right through their lives. And here was one more area in which they faced discrimination and exploitation. And, on the, and in spite of this, there were questions asked from the feminist side. Didn't women have a right to decide when the government could not provide and society does not provide for women's welfare do the women not have a right over their bodies to offer it as surrogates and earn from it when they do? Then there were the rights of surrogate women, which were also being called into question. What were some of these rights? Did the, did the surrogate woman have a right to refuse when the baby was born, refuse to hand over the baby? Did she have a right to terminate the pregnancy if she changed her mind? Did she have the right to opt out of the arrangement altogether halfway through the process? What are the rights of surrogate women? This was unclear. Who was, who was in charge of protecting these women, these vulnerable women? Was it the government? Was it the doctor? Was it the health system? Remember, we do not have universal health care in India. So who looks after the health of the mother after the event if she falls ill? 
Then there was a needs of commissioning parents. The parents who come into this uh, process, what are their expectations? Will they expect, will they accept any child that is born? Will they have rights to decide and determine what the surrogate mother will do during her time of pregnancy or what she will eat or what she will, um, how she will live? Many of these women were incarcerated into hostels and kept away from their families during the pregnancy. The doctors felt that that was one way to ensure that they were well nourished and protected from infections. But these women were taken away from their families for nine months. And then there's of course the issue of this cross-border international, cross-border medical tourism in Vibrash. And the, the entire capitalistic, global capitalistic outlook where people in whose countries decided that commercial surrogacy was not for them. This is something they did not agree with. Those, those citizens would cross over to another country where the regulations were not even in place and take advantage of lax regulations and avail of the women. And this was an ethical concern. And then there was a the talk about the legal aspect of the contract. Were such commercial contracts enforceable at all? The objective of the, trans of the contract is a child. Is that possible? And then a price is being placed on a human function. Can you, can you enforce a contract between two people to enforce the can you, of this kind where is it possible to insist that the mother, the birth mother, gives up her child? What if she does not want to do that? And can you force the intended parents to take a child if they suddenly change their mind and decide they don't want it? Is it in the best interest of the child at that point? In whose interest will such contracts be? Then of course there is the issues of, with the child being the object of this contract. The citizenship of the child was constantly being a, a matter of concern which, when it was, we are dealing with cross-country uh, reproduction. The identity of the child, who is the mother of the child, who is the genetic mother and who is the birth mother and though this was known to the doctor, regulations in different countries differed and this is where there was a problem uh, recurring again and again. The family relationships too, uh, people struggled with this. Who were these children born to these surrogates and how were they related to the surrogate's own family? There were children across the world who would find that they, they were surrogate children uh, and they would find that they were linked by a common father and they would find each other on the internet, their stepbrothers and sisters and try to connect with those families. So a lot of issues with family borders and family concerns of this nature. And then of course the ethical issue of the complicity of doctors who played up the emotion of childless couples, the discrimination faced in India by childless couples, the stigma attached to childlessness and they worked into that demand for a child and they, and they built that up and, and obscured uh, the ethical and the social implications of the technology. The other issue with doctors were that they were the experts on the panels that were discussing regulation and that was a huge conflict of interest. And so some of the stories that made the headlines very quickly, baby Manji was a, a child born to a, chi a Japanese couple that came to India for surrogacy. Uh, the, the father donated the sperm and they had a sub Indian mother who, as a surrogate. Now, very close to the time that the baby was to be born, uh, the couple divorced and the wife said that she did not want, she was not interested in the child anymore and she went back to Japan. And then the child was born and the father could not adopt the child because in India the laws say that a girl child cannot be adopted by a single male parent. So the child was left behind and they went to this case went to the courts. The, 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 the Japanese father for some time tried to insist on paternity tests and insist on taking the child, but the courts would not allow it since the birth mother was Indian 
and then his visa expired, so he had to go back to Japan. So this created an incident which was splashed all across the news. So finally, it was resolved amicably when the grandmother from Japan came to India and took baby Manji back. The other story was with Jan Balas and his wife from Germany. They came, they, they had this child in Gujarat and they wanted to put their names on the birth certificate, uh, but the courts don't allow that. The birth mother gets onto the birth certificate and then the baby is uh, adopted. And so this caused a lot of confusion at that time and uh, the baby was held back in India. They had to go back to Germany, get permissions. Germany did not recognize her new children. And so they had to get Indian passports for the two children. And they, had, they couldn't take the children away because it was like trafficking. When you just take Indian children away from India, that, that looked like trafficking. And so those issues also, well, finally these things got resolved, but this caused a lot of media um, uh, uh, you know, upheaval. Then there was the story of the Australian twins, where the Australian couple had uh, uh, used a surrogate in India. And then a boy and a girl were born. And the couple decided that they would just like to take the girl because they had a boy already and uh, they would not like to have the boy. So they just take the girl and leave the boy behind. Now, this was uh, not possible, it was unacceptable, but they refused. And is it in the best interest of the child to force the child onto a couple that doesn't want to take it? And so that became the concern. And the Australian High Commission said they didn't think it was in the interest of the child to force the child onto the parents and so the Indian government decided to take the child but before that happened the Australian couple found a friend in India who would adopt that child so all ended well there was an anxious moment in between when they thought that the child had been trafficked but this was the crisis with the Australian couple then there was the death of a surrogate in Gujarat in 2012 another Canadian couple <coughs> who uh, were ready to take their children away uh, when the child, children were born and then the Canadian government required a paternity test to be done on the twins uh, who had to be carried away and they found to their horror that although the father was, the father uh, had donated the sperm, they found that the paternity test didn't match. And so there was a confusion of whether the clinic let them down in some way or got the samples mixed up and so they were not allowed to take these uh, children for the longest time until finally this, this, uh, uh, this whole thing got resolved with the Indian government saying that they would take the children and keep them in India in a home uh, and then we'd work out a way in which uh, these, this couple would find another set of children to adopt. But they were not allowed to take this set of twins with them. And then at the time of the uh, Nepal earthquake, now Nepal is a country that does not allow its women to be surrogates, but it allows the birth, any woman to come to their country and give birth. So um, surrogates in India were going to Nepal to give birth there because that country allowed the names of the intended parents to be put on the birth certificate. This becomes important when they have to uh, prepare the passport for the children. So Indian surrogates used to go there and give birth there in Nepal and the children would be taken away by the foreigners there. Now when the, when the earthquake struck Nepal in 2015, it caused a sensation when Israeli helicopters flew into Nepal, picked up the little surrogate babies and the Israelis who were waiting there for the babies to be born and left the surrogate mothers behind. So there were there were these surrogate mothers who were left without a means of looking after themselves. Some of them post having given birth and some of them had not given birth at all. And they were just left there at the mercy of the elements when, uh, when the earthquake happened. So all of these things, you know, shocked the media and there was complete social condemnation uh, in, ev in every form. There were films, books, stories in the media, protests by social organizations, women's organizations. The Ministry of Health called for the Indian Council of Medical Research to come up with something uh, to, to deal with the social and legal issues. And, and the, the council was saying that you could have commercial surrogacy for, for those whom it was physically and medically impossible or undesirable to carry a baby to term, which was very, very difficult for people. 
And the Law Commission was advocating for laws that protect the right, rights and obligation of all parties. Many books, many movies, Chori Chori, Chupke Chupke, these are movies which are seen across the world. <laughs> Google Baby and, and also these books like uh, Baby Makers and Politics of the Womb. And so some guidelines emerged, ICMR guidelines, but they were still very tentative. They addressed everything about the technology, the clinics, the doctors, everything except these issues that we spoke about, the ethical issues and how those could be addressed. They talked about the age limit of women, the birth number of births that they could uh, undergo, the surrogate mother, the documentation, the types of people who could, but not the, so the issues at the heart of the problem. And so this bill went through successive um, formats and uh, improvements, but it still didn't get adopted till finally the government said, you are not looking at the issue of commercial surrogacy. This is the big issue. The rest of them, the clinics and how they will be regulated can be done later. So they just came down with this huge fine. They came down with this surrogacy regulation bill in 2016, which has been going in for parliamentary review, and that is why it's gone on to 2019. They're expecting that this bill will be uh, passed through both houses this year successfully. It has been dragged on because of the very, very strong lobby of people who own the clinics and who are back in, backing the clinics and invested in them. And so that is why it's taken so long for it. But over the last three years, all commercial arrangements and surrogacy have not been on. Now, it, it allows altruistic surrogacy, but it also talks about regulation of the clinic. And it's not a perfect bill, and it requires to be uh, updated in many, many ways. And we definitely still need the assisted reproductive technologies bill. To talk, it talks about the actual technology itself and the clinics. But for now, Services has to be back. And I'm happy at the end of it. If you'd like to ask any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thanks for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we had the uh, and we still have the same problem in other countries. For example, in Iran, there is no laws and regulations, but because it is a very profitable practice, the clinics took fatwas from religious leaders to allow the practice commercial surrogacy, and they have started the practice, and nobody actually dares to oppose those fatwas and stop them. And we have a lot of problems similar to what you mentioned maybe, I don't want to take the time of next presenter, uh, but maybe in the class I can give my students some examples of problems that happened in Iran. Also in the United States there was the case of baby M and other cases as a result of practicing surrogacy, so that's a very interesting topic. Our next speaker is, and she will be our last speaker, then we will have an ask question and answer session, and then we will have a reception uh, so we can also continue talking informally over uh, a small reception. So our, our next speaker is uh, Dina Signora. Uh, Dina was born and raised in Palestine and she is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in healthcare ethics at Duke University. Dina has been a graduate assistant at the Center for Health Studies for three years, and she, every year she plans and coordinates the Integrity of Creation Conference. The conference series was commissioned by the former president of Duquesne University. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Sciences with distinction, along with a minor in public health from American University of Beirut, and a master's degree in business administration from Duke University as a Fulbright scholar. The Fulbright program is sponsored by the United States Department of State. Uh, Dina's uh, lecture is titled The Approach of Health-Related Organizations Toward Complementary Medicine a comparative study between Arabic countries and the United States. Thank you, Dina, and uh, here is Thank you.
Hello. Hi. I'm so happy to be here presenting my presentation and my research with Dr. Armash. Um, I'm actually conducting my research uh, from Pittsburgh uh, at Duke University because I have classes to give and uh, uh, I, could, I cannot be here in person, but we collaborate through uh, email and meetings. So uh, we're, uh, our topic is a comparative study of the approach of health uh, organizations toward complementary medicine. Uh, we're trying to study the differences and similarities of co complementary medicine between the Middle East mainly and the United States. So first, uh, what is the definition of uh, complementary medicine? Um, uh, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Full screen. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, they define the complementary medicine as a non-stream, uh, non-mainstream practice used together with conventional medicine, while alternative medicine is defined as a non mainstream practice used in place of conventional medicine. And uh, when we talk about traditional medicine, we're referring to both complementary and alternative medicine. And it's defined by the WHO as the knowledge, skills, and practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures used in the maintenance of health and in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement, or treatment of physical and mental illness. And uh, both integrative and complementary medicine, they're both on the rise globally in the Middle East, in uh, America, in Europe, everywhere. And uh, they use, people use it mainly to treat chronic conditions like cancer, for example, because uh, sometimes people lose hope and there's no effective treatment, so they try to rely on more natural uh, uh, medicine and uh, to treat also diseases that cause so much pain, like arthritis or, or uh, bowel syndrome, for instance. Uh, in spite of all the growing use of com uh, complementary medicine, it is still not uh, taught for uh, doctors or healthcare professionals all over the world. It's still not integrated in the, their programs. So by, uh, these are some examples of complementary uh, medicine, uh, aromatherapy, herbal medicine, meditation, massages, and uh, acupuncture, all yoga, and all such these things. So I start talking about the Middle East uh, first, and then I go to the United States. Uh, in the Middle East, there's a high affinity for uh, complementary medicine. Why? Because the uh, Arabs have historical roots in ancient uh, Arabic medicine and doctors, uh, the Arab doctors, they had a great contribution to the immune system uh, and to the micro microbiological sciences. They uh, worked hard in this and uh, advanced the field of complementary medicine. And also because Arabs uh, back uh, back home, I mean, yeah, it's uh, widely available, accessible, and it's, uh, it's not that expensive like here in the US, it's cheap, and basically people from the lower class or average people who can get it and have access to it, uh, because it's like they use it as a first-line treatment or they use it with other uh, proven medicine. So uh, I found many articles talking about complementary medicine uh, in oncology in the Middle East. And uh, this is on the rise in the world, in Europe and the US, and also uh, in the Middle East, uh, namely Turkey, Jordan, and uh, Israel, Iran, and Saudi Arabia too. Uh, many uh, studies discuss the importance of complementary medicine uh, in these countries. and. Um, and uh, mostly they use herbal medicine, herbal medicine for uh, cancer-related diseases. So what herbs they use, examples are turmeric, uh, garlic, black human, camel, they also use camel's milk and uh, green tea. So, uh, and usually doctors would have a generally high uh, positive attitude toward uh, these herbal products and they advise it to their patient in, 
uh, in conjugation with other uh, well effective treatments. However, uh, there aren't enough studies that prove the efficacy of these er herbal components, and these herbs actually might uh, cause some uh, air drug interactions and would reduce the uh, bioavailability bioavailability of the drugs, of the cancer drugs. So doctors have to be cautious about prescribing these. And um, so in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, they use uh, complementary medicine for the treatment of uh, cancer. And however, uh, they don't cover the cost of this treatment. They just monitor it and they regulate uh, the, the, this industry through the National Complementary and Alternative Medicine Center established by the Ministry of Health. However, uh, they don't cover the costs. So what happens is that usually patients, they go ask their friends, their family, oh, what, what herbs do you use? And they take it or they ask like their pharmacist, their pharmacist would give it to them. It's readily available and it's cheap. And also, healthcare uh, practitioners in the Saudi Arabia they don't discuss these uh, these treatments or these herbs with their patients. So here, what happens is that the patient-doctor communication is not very effective because it's like, okay, I take it, and this might affect their uh, actual cancer treatment. So there are benefits uh, for uh, the herbs and there are risks. So how can we balance between those two? The benefits include like pain relief, nausea control, mood enhancement, and but there are potential risks, uh, especially when they're receiving the actual treatment. In Palestine, my home country, it's uh, the same. Uh, most of the things I talked about in Saudi Arabia relate to Palestine. We have the, our mountains are covered with plants and herbal medicine. However, due to deforestation and climate change and uh, degradation, uh, the availability of these plants and herbs is uh, decreasing. So uh, people are using it, but le to lesser extent these days because of the availability. Um, so what I was just talking about is that uh, there's a um, an issue of the patient and uh, uh, doctor uh, communication, and this leads to adverse side effects. Uh, for example, I will tell you, uh, people in Saudi Arabia, due to religious reasons, they drink milk, uh, the camel's urine, or they, they drink the, the, the camel's milk while it's not heated. And this is very dangerous. It causes like brucellosis or respiratory syndrome coronavirus that's related, that is actually caused by drinking um, uh, camel urine. Or another example, people would uh, eat honey because they think it's very effect, uh, it's good due to their religious or cultural beliefs. And then uh, it would uh, cause, it would worsen the, con the, the, the patient's conditions who have diabetes milk. So, and these uh, conversations don't happen in the clinic because p uh, just like the doctors won't talk about it or the patients won't discuss it. So that's why we have to be very cautious when we talk about complementary medicine. So here I suggest a model for the ideal communication between the patient and the healthcare practitioner. We can include another uh, third angle that includes the integrative physician. And he's the physician who studied the effects of, uh, of all uh, herbal uh, components and he, he knows and he can uh, be the, the link between the patient and the healthcare practitioner. So that's a model that's used in the US, but unfortunately we don't have it back in the Middle East because uh, it's costly. And even in the US it's costly, but some, some hospitals have implemented it and I will talk about it now. So in the U.S., as you can see in this uh, uh, graph, uh, mostly the priors are is the most widely uh, used uh, complementary medicine in, uh, between all these uh, 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 Hispanic or non-Hispanic Asians. 
The, and the second one is the herbal supplement. Um, the herbal supplement is the number one after the, the prayer. So natural products is when we take supplements and they're readily available in the grocery store or the supermarket. They don't need any prescription. They're all natural and they say it helps to treat certain conditions. So that's what people mostly use in the US. And the last one is the guided imagery. So exactly like the Middle East, complementary medicine is, is in the rise, especially the herbal products similar to, um, to the Middle East. And uh, there was a growth of 4% compared to uh, in 2011 compared to 2010. And in 2013, sales of herbal uh, products increased by 8%. So that's very, uh, increasing very rapidly at a high speed. Uh, and in the US, usually, opposite to their people who have higher incomes are the ones who have access to to the uh, complementary uh, medicine. Uh, and here they see that there's a study that said that the highest family income had more than four times higher mean per use out-of-pocket expenditures for visits to complementary practitioners than those with the lowest income. So that's a great difference between high and uh, um, low, middle, low uh, income earners. Um, uh, the cost of professional complementary healthcare clinical services uh, was 12 billion in 2007. And uh, it differs from one state to another, from one insurance to another, because not all insurances cover uh, the visits to complementary medicine, and it's, uh, it's different uh, from state to state. For example, in the state of Washington, uh, they require the private health insurances to cover the services of licensed complementary health care providers. And that's not the case in other states. It's widely varied and it's not very well known. So in my research, I will continue and try to find more statistics about which states and which insurance companies cover these. And this might lead to disparities and uh, ethical injustices in uh, the healthcare system because people who are rich can afford these and poor people can. So it, it's very uh, critical. Uh, as I said before, integrative medicine has been in the rise and it uh, has many benefits because, uh, especially for the uh, symptom relief, improvement in appetite, fatigue, emotional functioning, anxiety, sleep, and overall global health. And it also had the patients address their personal needs. So the approach was more patient-centered and more directed to the patient. And he, I, like, it would allow them to uh, take the approach that's more appropriate for them, rather than just prescribing medicines that might uh, harm them, actually, more than benefit them. So. One example is that the University of Michigan, they introduced an integrative medicine clinic in 2003, and uh, they had uh, positive uh, reactions from this program. Uh, however, why? Because uh, it included a shared decision-making between the doctor and the patient, and, uh, and it had many barriers. However, it had many barriers for the implementation. The cost of the program, the price is always a cost for implementing such services at the hospitals. And the lack of, the knowledge, lack of knowledge of the doctors, because as I said in the beginning of the presentation, that doctors uh, don't study the complementary medicine side in medicine, and that's why they might just want to go and, uh, and recommend conventional medicine rather than the complementary medicine. There are many methods to eliminate these barriers. I, I know that they might take so much time, but we can get there. Online courses for physicians, for example, or implementing integrative medicine, like the University of Michigan example, and we can develop a counseling integrative team, or we can just refer the patient to a, an, an integrative medicine clinic. So all of these approaches are doable, but they're costly and uh, they might take so much time to be implemented, but it's important to tackle these issues. 
uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you so much, Tina. Very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you again, all the speakers today and uh, all the attendees. We have time to take just a few questions. So, no questions. Yes, please. Hello, I uh, enjoyed all the talks, and I would like to address this partly as a comment and question to the scholar from India. Um, in 1984, I published a paper called The Moral Significance of the Genetic Relation in a Bioethics Journal. I think there's a copy in your territory. If not, I probably have one. But I don't know if you'd be interested, while you're here, to honor Edinburgh by taking a peek at that. that that's ancient and compared to the day. But I raised all these issues that have to do with you know, they do have to do with contract law and also morality and you know, poverty and commercialism, the extent of markets. And uh, there were some interesting cases in the news back at that time that I addressed. Now, I didn't comment this with any kind of metaphysics that's going to settle things. And I'm a little bit of a skeptic, but uh, you might be curious to look at that article. I would love to look at it. So uh, I think Jim Drain knows my name. Yes. At least he, I've heard of you. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it just struck me that so much of what you were talking about was on right on target with what I have written about. Uh, so I hope, but it's it's a jungle of it. It raises every question. Everything. In fact, I always say to people that this whole area of surrogacy is the entire world of bioethics and its concerns, you know, right. all wrapped into this one issue. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great way to teach bioethics, actually, because it can tease out all the bioethical uh, issues and concerns. But I would love to read that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we still will have time to talk and discuss. We uh, talk to uh, the presenters. We have a reception here. Please join us there. And uh, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Yeah.